Hello and welcome to a bit of a different episode of 90 Min Talks. We're going to hold our hands up. That's because we pre-recorded uh, our usual episode with Girls on the Ball before the big Jonas Eidevall news dropped. So we've jumped very quickly back into the studio to dissect everything that's going on at the Arsenal camp. And I'd love to welcome uh, 90 Min's very own content editor, Grey White Bloom, with us, who also is an Arsenal fan. Welcome, Grey. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> Thanks so much for jumping in last minute. No problem. Um, so let's sum up what's happening. It's been a very hectic day for Arsenal yesterday, and that's because Jonas Eideval, their head coach, has handed in his resignation. That came just after a few days after they lost 2-1 against Chelsea at the Emirates. It wasn't just that result, though, that saw Jonas need to hand in his resignation. They've had a bit of a, a, bit of a tricky start to the WSL season and not the best start to the Champions League. And that has really accumulated into a lot of pressure being put onto Jonas and fans asking, was he the right man for the job? So what's happening now is Arsenal's assistant head coach, Rene Sligers, has joined the club as their interim head coach. Now, Arsenal have said that it is a priority that they're going to be looking for uh, a manager to replace Jonas Eideval. But for the time being, it's Rene that's leading Arsenal into their second Champions League game against Valerenga this evening and their next WSL fixture against West Ham. But before we get there, I just want to want to ask you, Gray and come over to you were you were you shocked by the news and and do you think that the timing was right for the club well to borrow a word that Serena Vigman used I was flabbergasted <laughs> you know a lot of people have come out after and said they saw it coming and obviously you know results had not been good like you said but to have it announced on Tuesday morning so abruptly that he'd resigned as well and he'd only told the club I think, on Monday. I mean, yeah, very, very surprised. And you'd think with the international break coming up next week, that might have been a better time to have done it. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, first international break of the season is always when, you know, a lot of managers get the chop. But yeah, I think this is the first time since November 2017 that a top four WSL club has changed coach mid-season at all. So, you know, it's very surprising. Yeah, definitely. And usually in the men's game, we do see managers getting the chop abruptly, as yeah. you say, but it doesn't happen as much in the women's game. Now, there had been claims that Jonas Eideval had lost the dressing room a bit before their, their Chelsea loss at the weekend. Uh, and there were also been claims that he'd lost the fans. And I think that was evident with some of the booing that, that occurred at the Emirates after that loss over the weekend. A couple of days later, we also saw some pictures of graffiti just outside of the Emirates branding Jonas out and I think that's the that was a clear message from the fans that, that they really weren't happy with the way that their club was performing um, and they very much had put the blame on the manager but Gray I want to come to you as well and and let's talk a little bit about whether there's any coming back from it if you do lose the dressing room do you think that if you lose the faith of the players you can turn it around or is it pretty much the end of the road then I mean it's definitely a nail in the coffin isn't it you know you can understand why they may have lost faith in Idaval, given that this Chelsea performance was, you know, nothing new. You know, um, he didn't, their heads were down after the game in the talk on the pitch. He didn't lead them round the Emirates after. He just went straight down the tunnel. And, uh, you know, I the Chelsea game was bad, particularly <laughs> the first half. I mean, they got bullied all over. But the draw with Everton a week earlier was probably even worse. Because they just, it was just classic, a really uh, familiar pattern of failing to break down a deep line defence, which is plagued like the last two seasons. And it's interesting that under Montemuro, that was his big strength. You know, he very rarely dropped points against the so-called lesser clubs. And maybe he didn't do, do so well in the head-to-head. -head, and that's what Idaval was really good at. Like last season, they had the best record against Chelsea, City and United. But this year, he's already dropped points at home to City and then the loss to Chelsea. I mean, and now they're struggling against Everton. They scraped the win against Leicester. You know, 
It's a tough time. Yeah, the writing was on the wall. <laughs> and that's why I said it all, I think. Yeah. Um, we're now going to just um, cut to a clip of Captain Kim Little speaking at yesterday's press conference ahead of their Champions League game tonight, talking about the need for the players to really rally together uh, during this tough time. So let's take a look at what she had to say. Now, yeah, as a group and players, you know, are, as a part of the leadership group, we have to get the players together and obviously it's a big change, but we need to, to move forward now and, um, you know, change our focus. So we'll definitely see how the players respond under Rene uh, now that Jonas has gone and eventually when they have a more consistent um, manager in that position leading Arsenal. But that does take us on to to discuss potential replacements. And this this is a really exciting time. There's a real opportunity here for Arsenal to to hire somebody new and really sort of get back on the straight and narrow, let's say, and who knows, maybe win the WSL if it's still in their chances, in, in their grasp, I'm not sure. Um, but as ever with something like this, news, report, news reports have started swirling around who some of the potential replacements could be. And I think it's fair to say that the strongest candidate at the moment is looking like Casey Stoney. Um, she obviously was let go by NWSL side San Diego Wave earlier this year. So we know that she potentially is looking for a long-term long -term role. Um, and she also has experience at Arsenal playing ex-defender and also experience leading a WSL side with Manchester United in the past. What do you think about a potential Casey Stoney recruitment? I mean, she was out of the Emirates, wasn't she? She was. the game. That was quite convenient. But... I mean, that'd be great. You know, she did really well bringing United up to the WSL, just like when that franchise had like been uh, reborn. And it'd be very interesting to see what she can do on like a bigger budget with uh, what that Arsenal have now. But yeah, I'd, I'd be really behind Stoney. Or, you know, I've also seen whispers of Kelly Smith. Yeah, okay. Who was, <laughs> I mean, obviously absolute legend at the club and was part of the coaching staff recently um but yeah it'll be interesting to see if they get a female coach in because you know they haven't had one since Shelley Kerr in 2014 and it's just like in just a logistical sense you can spend more time with the players in the dress room you know I know that Ida Val was like limited by that for safe obviously safeguarding reasons mm -hmm. but yeah it'll be interesting to see who they go with you know there's uh, there's also the um, ex Netherlands manager Mark Parsons, who could be good. So let's get into the rest of the show with our usual guests, girls on the ball, Rachel and Sophie, and a very special guest, Tottenham Hotspur goalkeeper Becky Spencer. Thanks, Gray. Thank you. Welcome back to Ninety Min Talks. I'm your host Rachel O'Sullivan, one half of Girls on the Ball. On the other side of me, I've got the other half of Girls on the Ball, Sophie, as ever, joining us. Megan, of course, from Ninety Min, and today, very special guest. Tottenham Hotspur goalkeeper Becky Spencer you were here a couple of seasons ago we haven't scared you off I'm pleased to see that yep now I'm back and I'm happy to be back <laughs> what do you make of the studio last time it was a slightly different studio it's yeah, fancy now isn't it it's nice it's lovely you've upgraded and this is yeah Nice and comfy in here. Proper, proper studio in here. We get some fancy <laughs> graphics. In yeah, the, the TV changes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the lights can change. We haven't <laughs> we haven't played with that yet, but um, maybe today we'll see. Um, how's it been going for you? Is it a tough old weekend, maybe? Yeah, it was a tough weekend. I think it's um, you know, there was some promising stuff from it, um, and things that we can take forward into into the Chelsea game on the weekend. So I think for us, we just we're still building. Um, we're still trying to get the style of play that we want. Um, and I think it's coming out more, but now we just need to find the the kind of cutting edge when you know when we need to score and tighten up at the back a little bit but it's been tough but I think you know we'll only get better it's a hard thing as well when you have like a great season it seems to be the, the trend in the WSL that you don't want to be the team then you have the great season and then maybe stutter a bit so it feels like it, it almost adds a little bit of pressure does it uh yeah I mean we're not really feeling it at the moment Good. I think you know for us we're you know we've recruited quite well in the in the in the window and um, we've got some new players in and you know we feel strong um and as a team we're very together we've got a great team spirit um obviously we've got a great manager we've got great staff and I think we just need to believe in what we're doing um, and with that comes the ups and downs and it's a journey that we've been on and obviously I've been at Spurs for five years now so I've been there since you know they first came up and to see where we was then to where we are now is such a big difference mm -hmm. and I think you know the club are investing in us and you know we can only get better and I you know I fully believe in what the club are doing and the players that we're bringing in I think that's kind of a, a statement to to say look we're, we're here and we mean, we mean business so for us I think we're gonna 
keep going, uh, keep on the same page as what we're doing and just focus on what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. We know these journeys aren't always linear. Um, we've talked about Spurs a lot, yeah. of course, especially, you know, last season where you had this flying start and you were creating, you know, 26 <laughs> chances and like scoring all these goals. And it was very much a score more goals than the opposition will be fine. And then you had that difficult Manchester City game. And, and I think Robert almost looked at, right, we need to maybe look at the defending and you got, they got better defending, right? And then it's, I guess, trying to find that. I think you can see that this season. I know yesterday's result maybe doesn't tell the whole story a little bit, but I think, do you feel that in terms of the defensive work that the team has progressed in over the last you know, 12 months, from where you were this time last year to now, yeah. it looks so much more solid and like um, able to identify where problems might arise and, and, and deal with them? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that. We brought in Chris Williams from uh, Man City, the goalkeeper coach from there. Um, and he's been really, really good with us. Um, not only with the goalkeepers, but with the defenders as well. Um, so we can take some stuff from him. Um, and we've been working a lot on our set pieces, which was kind of a struggle last season for us. And in the games so far, I think, you know, a lot of the goals have been down to human error. Obviously, I've made a couple of mistakes in games. Um, and they've all been pre like preventable. So I think for us, we know that it's not the way we're playing. It's just human error, and you know, some of us are just making mistakes. And we just know if we can cut that out, then we'll you know keep a lot more clean sheets this season. So that's something that we've spoken about and we're aware of. Um, so yeah, I think you know for us moving forward, I think with the staff that we brought in and just how we're playing, and obviously we've got Claire in defence now as well. So we've got a lot stronger, and defending has been something that we've been focusing on. You're, of course, a, sport, a Spurs fan. How are you feeling about that? I knew Morgan? you were going to come I know I was going to come up. Imagine me ignoring you on this whole chat and being like, we don't care what Megan I would have felt a bit fine. left out. Um, I, I think I agree with um, Becky. I think the, that Spurs did play well yesterday, especially in that first half. Um, I think it's a... For me, I'll always say I think it's a little bit too early to make drastic predictions about how the league's going to end up. I think Spurs are committing to their, to their mission and their style of play and... There's, it's a long, there's a long way to go. They created brilliant chances yesterday. They didn't deserve to, to lose to that degree, in my opinion. So I think Robert's got his, his ambition. And I think if they stick to that, then they'll, they'll see some positive results. Going I think into. it's the change in the league this season. Maybe a little bit that you're seeing that the teams below, maybe the top three, have improved. You can already see the improvement. And while the results maybe not be coming quite yet, you can see what everyone is trying to do in that area in mid-table. And I think it's a that's been the tale of the first few weeks of the season is that everyone's up their game. I think the quality is so much better year on year compared to two or three years ago. So, and that's that's credit to the clubs in that area, so the Tottenham's and Brighton's of the world. Yeah, that's actually something we've talked about. Where we you know we often talk about like the quality of football improving, the players getting better, right? But tactically, managers, you know, all that kind of stuff. Actually, that's a real marked difference from mid-table clubs where there's a commitment to a style and you're not afraid to stick to it during a game and play it for 90 minutes. Whereas, you know, we see it with you guys. We saw it with you guys last season. We see it with Liverpool, with Aston Villa, with Brighton. You can see a style that a club are really committed to and you get that from Spurs, like you're really committed to a way of playing. Yeah, and I think obviously uh, this season there's been a lot more managers' uh, changes and I think they're bringing a different style of play to the certain teams. And I think, you know, early on in the WSL, a lot of teams would just go into a low block as soon as you would play against one of the top three teams and I think now we you know it's kind of with Robert especially he's like sometimes he's not so concerned about the result obviously we want to win games but he's like if I'd rather play attractive football than win a game doing long ball or you know doing the low block we want to give it a good go and play a good style of football Um, sometimes it comes with frustration because obviously you don't win you know when you want to win but sometimes we've just got to commit to the cause which is playing good football and I think then in a few years or you know the end of this season we'll see the the rewards from us persevering with what we we're actually trying to do so i think you know for us again it's just the belief in ourselves to really get nailed down what he's trying to get us to do um and then hopefully we can reap the rewards to the end of the season yeah because you're not going to get better or get better at a particular tactic if you're not under pressure doing it yeah. i guess and if you just fall back to kind of you know sitting back when you're under a lot of pressure then how yeah. are you ever going to i guess develop that bit of yeah. play um, anyway, what I should have done at the beginning of this was reminded you to subscribe, but I was so excited to get chatting uh, to Becky that I didn't bother doing that. Um, do subscribe because we do have lots of stuff coming out, some extra episodes and, and that kind of thing as well. And of course, covering matches on 90 Min social channels too, which we did at the weekend, which is where we're going to go to next, the uh, weekend fixtures. Um, some interesting results there. We had Arsenal versus Chelsea at the Emirates. Off the back of, of course, a, the first Champions League 
week of games um, and lots of narratives that we're going to come to there as well. But this was, of course, a big one at the Emirates. Arsenal under a little bit of pressure, haven't had the best start um, and they ended up losing 2-1 to Chelsea. Uh, some of the other results as well. Sorry, Manchester United 3, um, Spurs nil. We'll run across that quickly. Everton 1, West Ham 1, Crystal Palace nil, Brighton 1, Aston Villa nil, Leicester City nil, and Liverpool 1, Manchester City Two, so some interesting results there. Um, we have to start with Arsenal versus Chelsea. Um, what did you make of the game, Sophie? We were at it. It was very much a game of two halves. It was. I thought Arsenal's problems from midweek against Bayern really filtered into that, the first half of that game, and the way that Chelsea came out and you know that first goal, that Ramirez goal. It was a carbon copy of some of the other goals that they conceded midweek. It's that inability to deal with a delivery from the, the set piece or the corner. Um, and they just, just I don't know, completely lose their minds a bit. <laughs> In the middle of the box, they just panic. And when you have someone like Mary Ramirez, who is so, so good on the ball and so alert and so strong and so technical that she can produce a, a goal like that with a back to goal, um, you're going to be like... <laughs> uh, yeah, if, you, if you're not all set in what you're doing and all all prepared and kind of you're defending, then you're going to be, you know, there's definitely, looking down the barrel at it a bit. There's definitely nerves around that Arsenal defence now. There is. I've not actually, so going back to the Champions League game in um, the midweek, I've not seen Arsenal capitulate like they did in a long, long time. Um, I honestly can't remember when they've, they've sort of lost their heads like that. They're normally quite, while they lose games at times, they won't you know, concede three in the space of 13 minutes. It's just not something we really associate with Arsenal. Um, so, yeah, it was a real surprise, their lack of ability to, I guess, call on the leaders on the pitch or for the leaders on the pitch to get together and try and, like, drag everyone up and say, calm down a bit. They were just sort of running in circles a bit. And and the same happened in the first half, I think, at times. Yeah, they were 2-0 down very early on. Both lovely goals from Chelsea, from Ramirez and Baltimore. But then second half you know, a very different Arsenal came out, but the same problems in, in front of goal. They just can't seem to... And it's almost like sometimes you look at a match like that. If, say, the scoreline was reversed and it was Chelsea pushing for a goal, it almost felt inevitable that they would score. You look at the Manchester City-Liverpool game, it felt inevitable that Manchester City was going to get the winning goal. You don't have that same feeling with Arsenal at the moment. No, completely. I mean, they did come out into that second half and were a lot more attacking. And I think, you know, you talk about the leaders on the pitch maybe not rallying them up in that Bayern game, but it did seem as though that was the opposite a little bit in the second half. Despite everything that's going on with with the questions around Jonas, there did seem to be a bit more of a fight. But when they're attacking, shoot. <laughs> I know that <laughs> seems obvious in football, but, you know, they're like Cena Blaxinius, for example, is, you know, going into that penalty area, just shoot. But they, they're they almost overcomplicating it when, in, the, in the box. They're, they're passing it around. It, it gets blocked. It just didn't ever feel like they were making a play to goal and it was going to hit the back of the net. It wasn't pretty goal they're looking for, is it? Is, or are they? Af- is it a pretty yeah. goal they're looking for, or are they afraid to be the one to miss? I, I think it's a bit of both. But Caitlin Ford's goal to to Beautiful. take the score to two one shows that if you just go for it, it will pay off. So rather than overcomplicating it, I think they need to just just try and and shoot when they're in those attacking positions. I think Arsenal have always wanted to score the perfect goal. <laughs> it's like it's been it was the Arsenal men of old as well. They that's when they hit their problems is that and they always wanted to kind of pass the ball and around and then get it into the net in the prettiest fashion and you're always just like crying out just to take shots from 20 yards out and sometimes you know Mm. you'll be lucky and they go in or they'll be brilliant Um, but I I think that's the problem I'd also think that we've got too many square pegs and round holes with Mm -hmm. Arsenal and the pieces aren't quite fitting together and you're trying to play all of these brilliant quality players that we know on paper have all of the creativity you can imagine but they're just not being utilized in the right way. I think it's difficult as well. I think I've always said this, when new players come over and they, they come to a big team, it's really difficult to really get in there straight away. I feel like it takes them a lot of time to kind of get used to the league and get used to everything. And I think when you go to a maybe like a sixth place team or you go to a team that's not in the top three, you don't have as much pressure. So I think when you go to an Arsenal, when you go to a Chelsea, you have to hit the ground running straight away if you're going to be a starter in that team. Otherwise, you end up having games like they did on the weekend. So I think, you know, when you get a lot of new players, I think they've just really got to hit the ground running straight away, otherwise you end up struggling straight away. Are we, you know, from a player perspective, is it an overreaction that fans are concerned or media is concerned that Arsenal maybe haven't quite hit the ground running yet? Because we have to factor in, yes, they're only 
four games in, but they've had a number of Champions League games under their belt as well that maybe haven't been the most convincing. Yeah, it's an expectation. It's Arsenal Football Club and, you know, they're serial winners in, in women's football. So I think for a club like Arsenal, I feel like when, you know, the pressure's on, of course, fans are, are going to be asking questions and media are going to be asking questions about them because it's just an expectation and that's just the level that is expected of them. I think it's about showing progress as well. Um, you know, you can be playing really well and not getting the results and I think people are more forgiving with that. But I think you could arguably say that Arsenal haven't progressed from last season. They've still got the same old problems when they're facing, you know, deep defensive blocks, um, that they can't get through them. They create... A, a fair amount of chances, but they have an inability to score goals for whatever reason. And when you look at the players on that team sheet, those players shouldn't be having problems scoring goals. You know, you've got Alessia Russo and Stina Blaxenius and Caitlin Ford and Freedom Ornham. They're all goal scorers, natural goal scorers. So why, what is it about them in that team that is making them not have that kind of instinctive ability to, to score goals that we've seen so often? Beth Mead as well. I mean, she's struggling a bit at the moment, but her, she's best when she's instinctive and creative and allowed to be free on the pitch. So I think that's um, that's that's a big problem when you don't see progress. That's when that pressure mounts even more because when you're not getting the results, and I think I've said it quite a lot about the kind of the ghost of Vivian Namidema, that oh kind God. of looming Can quite large over them. Because, Looking down the table at them. Yeah. Like. The thing is, like you make your decisions, I guess, as a club for whatever reason, and for whatever reason they decided not to renew her contract. But if you make that decision, you sure as... <laughs> I need to make sure that it sticks and that you, it's the right decision and that it's your performances and go up a level. And mm. now your problem is that they've not and that she's now at Man City, a rival, you know, shining. Having flying, a great season so far. Having a great start to the season. And so that's going to be only add to the kind of pressure around those kind of decision makings at the club, I think. How much does outside noise affect teams? Do you, like, is it very much a blocking it out? Do you feel the pressure? Because we touched on it there. I'm sure there is an element of, you know, the players know they're not scoring goals. They know they're creating the opportunities, but not putting it in the back of the net. Do you kind of block out the noise? Yeah, I mean, you know, we put enough pressure on ourselves as it is. So, like, we're our own worst critics anyway. So I feel I feel like for players, we don't really listen to that outside noise. Although sometimes it's very difficult because mm -hmm. obviously we have to be on social media and there's a lot of stuff flying about and sometimes things pop up. But I think, you know, it's just about blocking that out. And I think a lot of players are very good at it. Um, so I think it's just about controlling and getting the balance of it. Um, but I don't see the outside noise really becoming a problem um, for any team. It, well, it shouldn't at this point. Mm. You know, you, we, you know, at this level, I don't think it should be a problem at all. Important point you made there that you are your own worst critics and a reminder that players are people. So when you're yeah. putting stuff on social media, <laughs> maybe just bear no, that in mind. It, it was also, this is football, right? Players, all players go through runs of good form and bad form and mm. it happens and it doesn't kind of take away from the quality that's on show is, is just trying to figure out what is going wrong to make it start going right. And I think when you have a number of players not, you know, hitting their heights like we know they can, that's when you start to ask questions of, of stuff that's going on behind the scenes, maybe. Yeah. So it means now with Manchester City winning their game against Liverpool, just although, it, as I said, I did feel like that goal was coming because Liverpool very much decided to try and protect their lead, which is never a good idea against Manchester City. Funny, sure. Oh my God, she's unbelievable. Um, but they are top of the table. They do have all other teams bar uh, Manchester United and Chelsea, obviously have played four games and Chelsea United are underneath Manchester City with the games in hand as well against each other. Um, so Manchester City, maybe unsurprisingly top of the table currently? Yeah, I think so. My uh, prediction um, the other week is, is riding higher. I'll take that at the moment. But I think, yeah, I do think that Liverpool played well against City in all honesty. They had a fair fair amount of chances. But as you said, you can't you can't be complacent when you've got Bunny Shaw up front. Uh, I think it was 93rd minute, I think. <sighs> but yeah. That's peak Manchester City of like yeah. the last season or two ago where they maybe not be 100% convincing, but found a way to get the win, which yeah. is the important point. Exactly. And I mean, they're on an unbeaten run as well, I think, in the WSL at the moment. You know, they're riding high off the back of that Barcelona win. So I think, you know, the the sentiment in that team is, must, is, is really good at the moment. And, and Gareth Taylor's doing a, a sterling job. So it'll be... Good to see how they perform later on this week in their second second Champions League game. I think there, there was a moment, actually not her goals, Bunny Shaw. Like while they they were brilliant, I think there was a moment. There was a clip I saw on social media. I think it was in the like 85th minute or something, 
and she's just like literally like running after the ball down the sideline, trying screaming at everyone, <laughs> keeping it. I in. saw that. Yeah, I saw, saw that. that one. Yeah. And I was like, that just epitomizes how she's kind of picking up this this game by the scruff of the neck, and was like, it was kind of more inevitable that she was going to score that winner late on because you could see kind of the energy that she was she was giving in that game. She was so desperate. For them to win that game. Yeah, I think that's a really important mentality that Manchester City have. Um, other games maybe not as exciting perhaps in terms of results. Um, Everton and West Ham both had a chance to drag themselves up out of that bottom part of the table uh, and chose not to. So they're both still down there. They drew 1-1. Um, I do want to shout out, I was at the Brighton Crystal Palace game and while it wasn't Brighton's best performance, I thought Crystal Palace played really, really well and they absolutely deserved a point out of that. And I think it's quite exciting despite the Chelsea result I think you can look at that score and make kind of decisions or criticisms about Crystal Palace without really seeing the match and in the first half they were very good and I think um, it's something Laura Kaminsky said to me yesterday they looked like a WSL team and I have to agree I thought they played really really well so I wanted to give them a shout out before we move on to Champions League and also most teams have kind of lost 6-0 at times to Chelsea it's not (laughs) that unusual (laughs) I don't know why you're looking in Becky's direction (laughs) there a couple of times (laughs) well I was going to say it was Manchester United and I thought maybe you'd want to um, (laughs) highlight that Um, that was probably the other fixture of the weekend but I think we've talked enough about that don't you we don't need mm-hmm. to rehash the Manchester United 3-0 <laughs> win uh, well done to them um, okay we'll move on to Champions League because we did have fixtures last week and some very interesting results and we have got fixtures this week as well it started with Chelsea Real Madrid at Stamford Bridge a familiar foe because this is the third season that Chelsea have had Real Madrid in their group um, a couple of seasons ago it was Wolfsburg they seem to draw every season and get knocked out by um, so I guess Madrid is slightly more interesting than Wolfsburg, I suppose. Is that a nice way of looking at it? Um, not their stadium. Their stadium's awful. No, so. no their stadium <laughs> isn't great. I'm, I'm, I'm partly, I'm kind of looking forward to going out to do this reverse leg when Real Madrid hosts Chelsea because last time I got food poisoning at, um, while I was there and I'd like to change that memory of Madrid <laughs> personally. That's understandable. <laughs> That's understandable. Um, but Chelsea did win 3-2 and maybe this is something that we kind of saw in the Arsenal game as well where they kind of steamed ahead early on, looked really dangerous, and then almost took their foot off the gas or didn't maybe have the ruthlessness we're used to from Chelsea because Real Madrid very much got back in the game and could have drawn. Yeah, 100%. So I was at Stamford Bridge and I, I would sum it up in, in that exact way. I think that they started off well, Chelsea, and of course they're Chelsea, so they're going to play some fantastic football and they got some great goals. But there was complacency there throughout that 90 minutes. There was some sloppy defending, which led to them conceding some goals. They took their foot off the gas And I think that showed Real Madrid got back into the game. And in that final 10 minutes, Real Madrid looked like they were going to equalise and take that game to three all. So there's some learnings for them to take away. But I think that a point, three points, good start to Champions League in that that group stage. Songa Pon Pastor, I'm sure, will be pleased. There's always improvements to, to move forward with. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they sort of continue into that group stage and hopefully take some learnings from that game against Real Madrid. My biggest concern about Chelsea is those wide areas defensively. Because they just looked so weak there at times. Um, you saw it at the weekend with Arsenal. I saw it with Real Madrid, where they can hit them down the flanks. And both for Sandy Baltimore, I love her as a player, but I'm not quite sure she's a real left back. Um, I know when Neves Charles comes back, maybe that's the solution, and then you push Sandy forward. Um, but there is a worry there. And then I think Lucy Bronze does struggle at times on the right side. Um, I know she brings so much experience, and there's so much more to her game. But then you look at what happened for Caitlin Ford's goal at mm-hmm. the weekend, and. She just kind of got twisted and turned by her. So um, I think, yeah, it's, it's those two fullbacks at areas that really, really concern me for Chelsea at times. Chelsea did have to deal with a couple of um, illnesses in, in the squad. Aaron Cuthbert wasn't available. Um, neither was Kat Macario. And then Hannah Hampton, very last minute. We had the liquidator, I think, played three times at Stamford Bridge while we were at the, the players were in the tunnel. <laughs> we weren't sure what was going on. And there was a very last minute change uh, in goalkeepers. So in terms of like managing that, that was that was pretty great. Bika Captain came in and she looked really good. She looks like a carbon copy of Aaron Cuthbert. But for a goalkeeper coming in last minute, like, are you are you always prepared anyway, just in case? But I mean, that's an unusual time to have to step in, yeah. in the tunnel. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. obviously like the warm-up, obviously you warm up as if you're playing, but obviously the starting goalkeeper has more mm. in that, I think. And, you know, the, the second choice goalkeeper for that game is like in for the shooting and stuff like that. So I feel like warm-ups are different, but your mindset kind of has to stay the same. It's never happened to me before, um, but I can imagine Musevic was more than ready for it. But it also then you know, on the defence and the team, sometimes that does bring, you know, a different mentality. 
Hannah and Rusevich are very different goalkeepers. Um, and they were also missing Kadisha Buchanan as well at the back, which you know, in her first game, she was excellent. So I think with all of that going on, I think it was you know, going to bring you know, that kind of challenges mm. to, their, to that performance. Yeah, yeah, it's having to adapt to changes, isn't it? And especially unexpected ones. Um, yeah. But when you can't quite have a settled back line as well, and it's constantly changing. So with Kadisha Buchanan, as you say, um, Natalie Bjorn's been in a couple of times. I know Millie Bright's always been there, but like, yeah, it just doesn't help, I guess, when you're trying to, especially in these early stages under Sonia. Uh, I think it's going to, yeah, you, you kind of want to keep that back for the same thing. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, Chelsea will be taking on FC Twente tomorrow, who won their first game against Celtic. Celtic, thank you. Uh, all I had in my head was Hammerby and Valerenga, and I knew they weren't <laughs> in that group. Um, right, we continued our form of choosing the wrong Champions League match by going to Bayern Munich to watch Arsenal get hammered. Um, got up at 3.30 in the morning for that one. Sophie, it was 5-2. Uh, it was equal in the first half, like in terms of scoreline, so perhaps didn't think it was going to be quite such a hammering. But as you alluded to earlier, a very, very quick um, hat-trick from Pernilla Harder in the second half and Arsenal kind of capitulating. Um, they were better in the first half. They played some decent football in the first half. Still were, not at their best, but... Yeah, they were more like... They were playing more, with more intensity, which is what Jonas Eidewell asked for pre-match. He was like, we have to go full throttle. And they did kind of do that for the first 25, 30 minutes until they got the goal. Um, and then they kind of took their foot of the gas. And I think Bayern Munich smelt that and they could they just upped the levels. I think Munich were quite happy to kind of sit off them. I think they'd probably learned very well about Arsenal's problems when you, you sit deep against them. And while it's not necessarily their style of play, they were quite happy to let them have the ball and, and run at them. Um, but then, yeah, they, they, they sort of got the sense that Arsenal were like struggling a bit towards the end of the half. And that's when they really put on their, their foot on the gap, the gas. And the, that equaliser just before half time, I think is an absolute killer because it's, you know, it's the worst time to concede. It takes all of your momentum away that you built in that first half. Everything's looking rosy. You're going in at half time, you know, ahead, and it just changes the team talk at half time. It changes everything, I think. And Byron um, came out. They just came out so fast. They mm. just decided to run at Arsenal, and Arsenal, just, the defence just couldn't handle it. I think had Arsenal lost two one to Bayern Munich and lost two one to Chelsea, it might not have felt as catastrophic. I think the manner in which, because realistically looking at that group, Bayern Munich is, and I mean Juventus is going to be hard too, but Bayern Munich would have been the biggest threat in that group. So overall losing to Bayern isn't the end of the world in terms of their Champions League progress but the manner in which they lost you know defensively um, set pieces you know I think they scored their Arsenal scored a set piece which was incredible but you know the way they, they really struggled to defend them I think that would have been the bigger concern right? Yeah I think so and I think it's just a case of everything coming at once for mm. Arsenal at the moment which is why they are ine inevitably going to get into their heads I mean their game this week against Valerenga that arguably should be their easiest fixture of the group but with everything else that's gone on now there's so much pressure riding on that it is a must win game and when that happens it's you get in your head and you, you're not able to perform in the best capacity that you would usually be able to so I think just the thrashing in Germany just accompanied by everything else is just not put them in great stead when you're in that kind of situation sometimes it's just a case of you need a game where you dominate or you score loads of goals or whatever it is to just almost get yourself out of that that cloud I suppose is that a fair kind of assessment yeah. it's like it's almost like when it rains it pours mm. and you can't it's like everyone's trying but nothing is going right and I feel like you have to kind of ride the wave you know for as long as it may be and then something all, almost like clicks and something just changes and then you end up getting a good result or a positive result and then you can build on it. But until that comes, it is a very, very tough time to, to have. Um, I've experienced it a few times and it's tough. Even if like, I think it was um, two years ago with Tottenham in the relegation battle, there was nothing that we were doing. We were playing well on the weekend, but we had no luck. Everything just kept going in. We couldn't score any goals. And then you end up in you know a real tough position. And I think for Arsenal, it's a similar kind of, you know, obviously the outside noise is coming in now and not getting any positive results, it does start to weigh on you a little bit. You do really feel for the players you could see at the end of that Chelsea game because, you know, I think maybe in the first 20 minutes you thought maybe this is going to be a really tough day at the office for Arsenal. Not that it was worse that they got back into it, but the fact that realistically <clears throat> they could have drawn that game, you could see them drop to their knees and you know it's like a really tough time for the players at the moment. Yeah, I mean, they put everything into the game mm. and I think, you know, the midweek result, it's really difficult to go to Germany, especially uh, Bayern Munich and go to their home ground and, and get something from that place. So I think 
in that result, like you said, it's not the end of the world, but it's just the manner in which they lost was maybe more of a telling sign than anything else. I think it was all triggered by that point against Everton as well. I yeah. think not yeah. getting that win against Everton at home at the Emirates, when you do dominate possession and do create chances, whether they're high quality or not, it's not putting that game to bed then triggers into the rest of the week. And then you it puts more pressure point. on the future yeah, games, because right? Then, well, then you're looking at Bayern and you're saying, well, they come away with a narrow loss or a draw. That's that's reasonable. But then, you know, to capitulate like the way they do. And then you've got 48 hours to recover from that, to go into Chelsea. It's just like this knock-on effect that just makes oh, it... I can just feel the pressure. It's like and an it was, exam or something. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was also massively reflected in the atmosphere at the Emirates. I know we were there. The, the fans just weren't behind the team that... Chelsea, yes, they brought in a good crowd, but and and they were they were obviously leading at points, so they're going to be louder. But there was just almost no noise coming from the Arsenal stands at all. And I think you know you mentioned the, the it being tough on the players. It was hard to see them come away from that team talk that they had at the end of that game, and some of them had tears in their eyes. You know, it, it's really really mm -hmm. difficult to see that. And I think it will be interesting to see what the atmosphere is like at that Champions League game as well and whether that's being reflective reflective on the turnout and the attendance. So mm. it's just, yeah, it's just a tough, tough time. It's a really tough one because Arsenal clearly led the way off the pitch in terms of yeah. building the fan base and what they're doing at the Emirates and all of that stuff. But I'm not saying it's tenuous. I don't think it is that tenuous, but I do think you have to... You can't expect it to continue forever if you aren't performing. And when you're Arsenal, you have that expectation. You have this history behind you as well of the club. And people expect you to be in the latter stages of competitions and in the title race. And if you're not in either, then people are going to start going, well, you know, especially if you're new to the sport, I think it is, it's less of a hook. So yes, yeah. there's no incentive, is there? Mm -hmm. if you're there not is a worry around that, I think, as well, in terms of like everything good that they've done off, off the pitch you want to keep them going, but it does need momentum behind it. And if the team is struggling, then the momentum kind of wavers maybe a little bit. I do want to touch on the point that, yes, all three of us were at that game, but we were in that game in very different capacities. Yeah, we were. <laughs> these, this pair were on a box and I was pitch side in the pouring rain shooting. So quite a different experience. I was and having Wi-Fi stresses. So. Yeah, I was going to say, Sophie did watch it from the TV at one point. Well, no, but I win. No, Lash, yeah, Lash true, and rain, true, true. terrible. Now, okay, we need to give some flowers to Manchester City because this was the tie of the of the... Champions League round, I think. Um, going out there, beating Barcelona at home 2-0, um, playing some really good football, particularly in the first half, and then weathering a bit of a storm maybe in the second half, but showing how committed they were to the plan. And actually, Gareth Taylor changed his plan a little bit, which was good to see. But how good was that game? Yeah, I mean, it was excellent. I think the game plan, obviously, that Gareth Taylor put in place for them worked a treat. I think, you know, with Barcelona being so stubborn with their style of play, you know, they didn't want to go over the press. So it just limited them getting forward, basically. And um, they defended well. And like, you could just see from the start, like their intent, they were aggressive. They was on the front foot, the press, you know, Barca really struggled to get, in, get into any rhythm that they would usually get into. Um, and of course, Bunny Shaw was, you know, she was spectacular that game as well. And I think... With her up front, you're always going to get a goal at some point. And not just up front, in the second half, she's back defending, you know, <laughs> set pieces. like, And I think that shows, if you compare and contrast, say, not to bring up Arsenal again, but, you know, a commitment to a game plan where you all know exactly what you're doing. And that was what you really saw at Manchester City. Everyone understood their role. Everyone understood that if they did what they were told to do, this would come off. And yeah, I think Bunny Shaw kind of encapsulated that by not only getting goals and playing well up front but coming back and defending for their lives at times yeah. they, they understood the assignment very <laughs> very well and bunny shaw is always magic but there's something about the magic of the champions league married with the magic of bunny it's all it's all too much um but also a massive shout out to naomi lazel oh, yes. um i know one of you are probably going to get onto that anyway but i mean scoring on a champions league debut signed to the club this summer like just phenomenal and I feel bad because she maybe didn't get an opportunity to, to do a celebration because I think Alex Greenwood like practically jumped on top of her. We but did, yeah, <laughs> you could see that that meant everything to them, obviously, for, for getting a goal up against Barcelona. But for her particularly, you could see that the players were so pleased for her. And I think what an absolutely stellar start at a club for her. We uh, chatted to Naomi Lezel before the season started at the media day and you were speaking to her about joining Manchester City. And, you know, perhaps we thought Maybe she wouldn't get loads of playing time. And, <laughs> and she, you asked her about the Champions League and she was like, just to be in a team that's in the Champions League to maybe like get involved at some point. And not only does she get involved at some point, um, she has a brilliant performance. She scores her first senior goal against Barcelona. It's pretty good. <laughs> good way to start your yeah. career. Um, I, I would say that I think 
going back to your point about their performance, they're, that's what you have to do against Barcelona. And I think that was my worry going into the game is that sometimes it's a Manchester City are a brilliant football team, but I do sometimes think that, and Gareth Taylor has said this when he speaks about his plan A and his commitment to his plan A. So I was a little bit worried that he wasn't going to shake things up a little bit or just tweak things. I think I thought he was going to stick to his style, but I think when you're playing Barcelona, you do have to figure out, you know, a different way of doing things to be able to nullify their threats, but also exploit them. Um, and so I, I, I was surprised by that. I was pleasantly surprised, I think, by the way that they performed. I do think, though, I, not to take anything away from Manchester City's performance. Don't do it. <laughs> Go on. Barcelona's shorts. That that has it to be there. There's, yeah. there's a reason. There's a reason they were... <laughs> there's not. <laughs> what are you talking it about? Like it. it was a problem, I think. <laughs> but we do, we do, like we said about Arsenal and their loss to Bayern, this won't be the end of the world for Barcelona. You yeah. know you can lose a game in the Champions League group stages. I mean, they drew a brand last year, right? So, um, but yes, don't mess with the kit, guys. Yeah, but also like a team like Barcelona, they've like got all of the history behind them and they're always so like perfectly put out <laughs> and then they come up with some white shorts what? for that shirt and I'm just like <laughs> <laughs> we found the reason <laughs> um, okay let's quickly touch on international break which is happening next week England will be playing Germany and South Africa good opposition good test for England and an opportunity to maybe see some fresh faces these are friendlies of course there's nothing big riding on them but they are you know Germany at Wembley yeah for sure I think it's a really good opportunity for Serena Wiedemann to have a bit of a rotation in that squad and and see how different players connect with one another um there are tests obviously the Germany and the USA game are both being played at Wembley Stadium so they're probably sellouts. So there's a pretty big expectation on those for us to perform. But I think it will be, I'm certainly interested to see how, see what results we get out of those games, bearing in mind the last time we saw saw them play was in the qualifiers where they came up a few against a few difficulties. So it'll be interesting to see how they perform. Obviously we do want to walk away with wins because I think that'll put us in good stead and maybe reinstate a bit of belief uh, for the Lionesses ahead of the Euros next, next year. And two different types of opposition as well. So that kind of gives England a challenge to come up against two different types of football, which is important going into a Euros, right? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think playing against South Africa especially will be something that, you know, England haven't really experienced before. Playing against African teams are very difficult. It poses such a different threat. Um, and like you said, having fresh faces in, a, in friendly games and just seeing how different people work. I think it needs a freshen up. Um, and just to see who, you know, is fit for purpose for, for, the, for the upcoming games. I think you have such an opportunity over the next six months. Um, yeah. And it's a real good, like not having to worry about the playoffs is a really, really good thing for England. I think they look really tired over the last couple of years. And inevitably, you know, you go to the end of the Euros, you go to the end of the World Cup, and then um, you just don't really have time to re reset or reevaluate or take, you know, take a breath. So I think the next, you know, four windows of friendlies are going to be super important for them. Um, Getting someone like Jess Park really established in that kind of number eight, number 10 area is going to be key, giving her more game time. Um, and seeing maybe someone like Lazelle if she's fit. I know she picked up that ankle knot, but if she's fit, maybe she gets a chance to come into the senior squad. There's just this real opportunity that you don't get very often in international football these days where you do have what six to eight games that you can play around with things and really figure out that team ahead of um, next summer but also I think with the player, more senior players who maybe are struggling at the mobile moment or not quite in form it gives them a time to get away from club go to international team there's less pressure because there's nothing riding on the games yes they want to win of course but at least you can maybe start having some fun again yeah before we wrap I want to ask quickly as well you know as a player, when you've got this kind of relentless schedule and England had the Euros, obviously don't need any help getting excited for that and doing <laughs> themselves up straight into a World Cup. But like, how hard is it mentally to sustain that kind of, desire is the wrong word, but you know what I mean? When a team is really like, we really need to win, we really need to win. And you're maybe in Nations League or qualifiers and it's just like a relentless schedule. How hard is that as a, as a squad to kind of sustain that? Yeah, like, you know, if you feel like the day's just rolling into one and you don't know like whether you're coming or going and it's, it becomes very difficult. I think it's, um, you know, as prof it's our job. So as professional footballers, you know, we learn how to get on and there's different ways of, you know, being able to focus in the, in the, in the, in the important moments. Um, but the schedule is relentless and I think you know for players and even like you said with this next six months I think with some of the senior players it might give them an opportunity to rest as well um, and just manage certain players because there's a lot of important players that England have 
And I think now the scheduling, you know, it, their friendly is coming up. I think now you need to look at it and go, OK, well, maybe we could manage this player or maybe we can manage this player in this window just to give them a bit of respite because it is relentless and players are tired. Mm. Um, and it's just the start of the season. And I feel like you can already sense that. I don't know whether you can see that in people's performances or not, but some players are tired just due to the amount of games that mm. they've been playing. Yeah, yeah, totally understandable. Well, we have that to look forward to next week as international break. We've obviously got Champions League uh, this week and then we've got the WSL in between all of that. There's loads for you to look forward to. There is also a special episode that we are going to be dropping soon as well with Becky about uh, England's goalkeeper situation. So do keep an eye out for that. Thank you, everyone, by the way, for joining. It was a good chat. I feel like we could have carried on. I've probably gone over time. Um, but if you don't, make sure you don't miss any of these upcoming episodes. If you've subscribed, you won't. Uh, and you'll be the first ones to see them. Um, we will chat to you very soon because I know we'll have loads again to talk about when we do come back. See you then.